The Taillow mixer I built up in a previous video is very simple but can be a little bit tricky uh, to debug if it doesn't work. So what I thought I'd do is do a quick video walking through some of the steps that I do when the uh, circuit doesn't work. Uh, and it happens more than I'd like and, and I've built up quite a few of these Taillow detectors. Um, so anyway, uh, th these are the steps that I do. I hope it, uh, it aids in any debugging uh, that, uh, that, that people are doing on this circuit. So really the, the test equipment that you need is, um, at least for these IQ style radios, certainly you need a multimeter. I mean, that's, we're going to check for voltages around the circuit. Um, you do need a signal generator, um, and that signal generator needs to be able to generate, uh, well, I'm using it here to inject the RF signal coming in uh, through right here. Uh, and so that needs to be, uh, needs to be the receiving frequency. So this is a 40 meter rig, so uh, I need a signal generator that can that can deal with uh, around about seven megahertz output, which I do have. Um, you need a source of, for your Quadrature LO. So you've seen before in the videos I've run before, the SI5351, that's a great source to uh, generate your, uh, uh, your LO uh, Quadrature signals. Uh, and obviously we'll be generating uh, these signals that are around the, uh, around the frequency of the uh, desired uh, uh, receiving RF signal. And then finally, uh, what you'll need is an oscilloscope. Um, now, with other styles of radio, like a superhet radio, you, you don't really need an oscilloscope to do troubleshooting. You can inject a signal, you can sort of trace the signal through. But with the IQ style of radio, because, you know, everything that uh, is uh, in the radio is dependent on having those signals come in, the quadrature signals at 0 and 90 degrees, if you can't see that on the, uh, you know, if you can't see that on the oscilloscope, it can be very hard to troubleshoot. So definitely, I have an oscilloscope here, and it's it's very helpful. It has been very helpful to me to for troubleshooting these radios. So one of the other things you need to do, and if I could just uh, sort of pan onto the circuit here, is create a series yourself a series of test points on the circuit itself. There's nothing worse than when you're trying to debug something on the circuit and uh, you think you have uh, one of the probes attached and it turns out it's not attached at all uh, or alternatively you have to hold it in place while you're trying to while you're trying to fiddle with the with the oscilloscope so definitely create a uh, create a set of um, uh, test point connections on the board itself so you can so you can see that for yourself so to kick off the debugging let's just first confirm that the circuit i have here is actually working correctly uh, that way we'll have sort of a baseline for all the measurements that I'm going to do. And just to remind uh, sort of what we're looking for as, as successful here, uh, this is a sort of a very rough block diagram of the TALO mixer itself. So I inject RF here, I inject LO at 0 and 90 degrees, both into the mixer here. And then what I expect to see on the output here is 0 and 90 degrees of RF minus the LO. Obviously, that's the absolute value here. Here we don't have negative frequencies. So, uh, so theoretically, if I have a seven point uh, seven point uh, one five one megahertz signal coming in through the RF, and I have a seven point one five zero megahertz signal coming through the LO, I should get a one kilohertz signal in quadrature at the output. So that's the expected result. So let's just go through the test setup and uh, and see what we see. So here's the uh, SI5351 outputting the the LO signal coming in into here and here on the on the board. I've got the RF signal coming in here on the other side, and then basically these two oscilloscope probes are probing the I and the Q output. So just to go through the exact uh, frequencies that we've got here. So I'm injecting a 1.7.150 uh, megahertz signal at minus 30 dBs uh, for my RF signal. And I happen to know that the LO is actually running at 7.150127 megahertz. So in other words, the current difference between them is 127 hertz. If we look down onto the, uh, onto the oscilloscope, excuse the... Uh, Cables in the way there. You'll see there's that 100 and roughly 120, uh, 127 um, hertz signal on the output there. 
And note also that the two signals are in quadrature, or 90 degrees apart. So that's the expected that result that we're seeing. So let's change the input frequency up here to, let's go down to 7.149. 7.149. Seven point one four nine megahertz, and now if we pan back to the oscilloscope, you can see that the output frequency has indeed changed. Whereas it was one hundred and twenty-seven hertz, now it is one point one two seven, one two nine kilohertz. And again, those signals on the output are still in quadrature. So basically, that confirms that. What I'm getting out of the Taylor mixer is indeed RF minus LO at both 0 and 90 degrees. So let's go through some basic uh, kind of health checking on the board uh, before we move ahead. And I think the first thing before you hook up power is to check that the orientation of the ICs are right. So, you know, obviously with the, with the dips, it's easy. They have this little notch right here and this is pin 1. And this is pin 8, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So, so they're pretty easy. Uh, with these SMD ICs, it can be a little more, bit more difficult to spot where, the, uh, where pin 1 is. Now, this one's pretty easy because there's a bar that uh, indicates pin 1 on the, uh, on the, the right-hand side of the, the diagram here. So that goes 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then all the way up to 16 here. So checking the orientation of those ICs to start with is, uh, is, is kind of the critical first step. And you want to do that if, uh, before you connect power. Uh, if you connect power, um, uh, you will blow this. Uh, if you connect power the wrong way, it, it will blow this chip. There's no question about that. Uh, I'm speaking from personal experience here. The uh, op amps are a, bit, a little bit more robust. Uh, but even, even the op amps, uh, if you put uh, power to the wrong chip, they'll... Uh, you will likely blow your op amp. Uh, luckily, both of these are super cheap. Uh, I mean, these FST 3253s are available for, I uh, can't really remember exactly what I got them for, I think around 30 to 50 cents uh, from DigiKey. So they're both cheap, but ideally you don't want to be blowing any of these. So once you've confirmed your ICs are the right orientation, next, next thing to do is to check power on the ICs. So let's start with the, uh, with the op amp. I mean, typically the op amp will be at um, uh, will be at the supply voltage, uh, which in this case is around about 10 volts. So let's probe pin 8 and pin 4, and you can see they're 10.4 volts. So the supply to the op amp is correct. Next, we'll move on to the supply for the FST 3253, and that's a little trickier to get to, but it's pin 16 right here. Let's actually get onto the pin itself. Pin 16 right here, and then pin 8 is the ground to the FST3253. Bear with. So there you can see 4.96, 4.97 volts. So the supply voltages to both the ICs are correct. Next thing you want to check is that the mid-rail bias um, that is uh, associated with the uh, with the splitter is at at 2.5 volts or, or, or roughly 2.5 volts. So that's this point on the on the circuit here. Now this is critical because uh, you need to bias the op amps correctly in order for them to function. If you don't bias them correctly, what what will happen is you'll get uh, you'll get clipped signals. Um, and uh, you know, the whole circuit won't work correctly. So let's check that the voltage here is roughly 2.5 volts. So this is all a bit tricky, but I can use these, uh, these connectors here as a convenient ground. And then if I probe the midpoint of the uh, splitter right here, you can see there, it's jumping around a bit, but 2.83 volts, which is exactly what we want to see. So the next thing you want to check, and particularly in this configuration where we have the, th the two channels in the FST uh, 3253 connected to each other, you want to make sure that the pins here are correct, correctly connected to their counterparts over here. If you get it wrong, basically, uh, uh, the, the intent of these is that they basically are the, they are the same value. But if you get it wrong, then 
you won't get the correct output here. So basically what we're looking for is 6 must be connected to 13, 5 must be connected to 12, 4 is connected to 11, and 3 is 10. Now this is uh, additionally complicated if you're using this uh, sort of homebrew via thing that I've been using on my circuits here. Bear with me, I've got to get some focus. So I've got the vias here doing that, so it sort of cr crisscrosses underneath and above the board. Uh, but you've got to make sure that, uh, that uh, the FST connections, FST3253 connections are correctly attached to one another. And additionally, that, that applies if you're using this sort of homebrew via concept and you don't have a proper made board. Check each and every one of those via connections to make sure you're getting full continuity uh, from the reverse side of the board to the top. Uh, I've had many a case where uh, you, you think it's connected, it looks connected, and you find you have uh, kind of a gap in the, uh, in the solder joint of the via. Uh, very easy for, me to, for, for you to do. So the next thing you want to do is check to make sure that your LO signals are coming in to the right, um, the right pins on the FST3253, which is pins 14 and 2, you want, to, so you want to confirm a couple of things, that obviously that they're at the right frequency, the frequency you're expecting, and then 90 degrees out of phase with one another. So if we just pan onto the board here, and uh, it's going to be a bit tricky to see it. Um, so I've created a couple of test points, uh, one here and one here. This one goes to pin 14, and this one over here goes to pin 2. Uh, I've hooked them up to my scope. And then let's just pan up to the scope, uh, bear, bear with all the, uh, the crazy uh, scooting around here. And there you can see those two LO signals, uh, and you know, they're in quadrature. Uh, they're not exactly the right, the same amplitude. Um, I mean, that can, that's, can be caused by a variety of reasons. Um, that's not really something to worry about at this stage, but you can confirm that the right frequency and that they're uh, in quadrature. So the next thing we want to do is confirm that this splitter is working correctly. Um, so the job of the splitter is to take the RF signal through here, through the bandpass filter, and then produce a phase and antiphase signal. So these two signals should be at the RF frequency, but 180 degrees out of uh, 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 180 degrees out of phase with one another. And that's critical to this particular circuit. Uh, there are other circuits using the FST3253 where you don't require those phase and antiphase signals, but this one absolutely requires it. So let's have a look at the board, uh, and I've created some, some new test leads, and basically it's going to be hard to, to see this, but these test leads are on either side of the splitter transformer. So the middle one is effectively the 2.5 volt, volts bias, and then either side is the, uh, is the phase and antiphase signal. So let's have a look at that in the oscilloscope. And again, just panning up, this is what I've got on the, uh, the signal generator, 7.149. And then panning up onto the oscilloscope, there's the phase and antiphase signals. Now one of the things that I've noticed with this is I currently have the circuit powered off looking at this. Uh, when you power it on, you'll get a pile of distortion on there, uh, but you can still see the phase and antiphase signals. Um, uh, it, it, there's just a whole pile of, uh, uh, of harmonics going on there. So if you have it off, you can actually see those signals for yourself. Um, and that's what you're looking for. So you can see those two signals are coming in, they're, we're at the right frequency, and they're exactly 180 degrees out of phase with one another. So now we get on to the part of this, uh, the debugging, which is honestly the, the trickiest, and that's uh, checking the actual output of the FST3253 itself. And unfortunately, the, the output here is very rich in all sorts of harmonics. Um, and, and so it becomes difficult to see the waveform. So one of the things that uh, you can do, though, is on your signal generator and your RF input, turn the, uh, uh, turn the, uh, so the uh, amplitude of your RF input higher up. That'll give you a better chance to see the signals. Um, so anyway, uh, what we're expecting to see here, though, was on each of these four outputs, and this isn't in the strict order, 
an output at zero degrees, an output at 90 degrees, an output at 180 degrees and 270. And the antiphase components of those, so in other words, the zero and 180 and the 90 and 270 should be presented to the same op amp input pair. So in other words, if this, these two signals should be antiphase, and these two signals should be antiphase. So I'm probing at uh, two of those antiphase pairs at the moment. Just let me take the, uh, the scope off. Uh, so this is the scope uh, in run mode, and you can see the waveform is very dirty. Um, but you can see these, let me just stop that again. You can see those two signals are actually in antiphase. So what we should also see is if I probe, let me change that to probe, let's say here. Now these two signals should be 90 degrees out of phase one another. So in other words, the pairs to the same input pins of the op amp, so in other words, pins two and three, and pins five and six should have the antiphase signals. And then if you probe, let's say pins pin two and five, you should get see those two signals at 90 degrees out of phase with one another. So obviously, uh, because the op amp, uh, it's a, you know, it's a, a differential amplifier, uh, it amplifies the difference between those two antiphase signals. Um, so if you if the signals going uh, to the to the same op amp pair are in phase, uh, then you're going to get nothing on the output. Now, honestly, this is the this is the hardest part of debugging because you've got to weed out. Uh, all this messy signal. But as you can see here, if you turn up turn up that to the amplitude of your input RF, you can actually see, let me just stop that so you can see it. So there's two uh, 90 degree signals themselves. Um, so that's kind of about it for the debugging. Um, uh, I don't have, uh, uh, I don't have much uh, other advice to offer. Um, I mean, there's the usual stuff you've got to go through checking continuity. Uh, making sure that uh, you don't know, have any weak solder joints, that sort of thing. Um, you know, th this, this sort of testing is all after um, uh, that you've done all that. So anyway, I hope this is helpful. Uh, I know a few people asked for it. Um, you know, please, uh, if you have any um, questions or, or you're stuck on your own TALO uh, detector, don't hesitate to put a comment there. I, I'll help where I can. Um, I'm no schooled expert on this. Uh, I have put a few of them together, though. That's all for now.